for the time. Tea time. Yeah, this tea time. Yeah, make a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Make a difference. One cup at a time. Good morning and welcome to Tea Time with Miss Liz. That's right, I am back and we are at the end of November. We are on the last three for November and then we have seven left and then we're doing the amazing reunion Tea Time where you see guests from season one, two, three, and four. And we have the largest audience coming back this year. We have over 75 attendees so far. There are still more coming in. We have 14 different countries that will be joining that reunion. So be sure to check that out. But this morning, I have the amazing Audrey Burbrown joining me. And we're going to be talking about the Holocaust and the story that she wrote, her father's story. So we're going to talk about the American Wolf. So Tune in, grab your, grab your tea, grab your coffee, grab your breakfast. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, go ahead and do that right now and ring that little bell so that you're notified when all those tea times come live. Uh, each and every tea time is different. We do, ta I do different topics, different flavors, and different blends from all over the globe. So we do want to get Audrey in here. So, But before we get started with that, we're going to do the disclaimer and we're going to get Audrey in here right after I do a little bit of her bio as well. So stay tuned for that. We're going to get that going, and then we're going to get Audrey in here, and we're going to spill you a good, strong cup of tea this morning. And yes, as you can notice, my voice is a little choppy this morning. Uh, it, I am fine. It's just from having a little bit of crying my, from my grandma passing, but I am fine. So if my voice gets a little too choppy, I'm sorry for all the listeners out there if it's a little rough on your on your little ears. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz's live tea time live show. Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any tea time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward for, may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookiemissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect your wishes and will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea times in 2023 are done on Thursday, 10, 3, and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you see a tea time that's not on a Thursday, it's a rescheduled tea time or it's a surprise guest that wants to come back for a second cup of tea. So now a little bit on Audrey. Who is Audrey? Well, let me get a little bit on Audrey. So Audrey, and let me get her over here. Um, 
Audrey Burbaum is a met. Uh, let me see. Audrey now enjoys singing, writing, reading, and being with friends who also had quirky childhoods. She lived with her husband in Westchester County, New York, and has three marvelous grown children. Audrey is currently working on her second book, but we're going to talk about the first book. So Audrey, growing up in the 1960s, Burba, assumed that watching Holocaust doc documentaries was a perfect, normal family activity. On her first day of elementary school, Audrey sat in the cafeteria, unwrapped her liver wart, wart sandwich, and excitedly told her new classmates about her public television per prolactity. Her Brady Bunch watching peers had never heard of PBS, but they had heard of P PB and J, and they weren't too keen on the liver liver warts either. They made it abundantly clear Audrey's childhood was, in fact, not normal at all. So let's get Audrey in here and let's find out how her childhood was and all of that good stuff. So let me get her in here. Welcome, Audrey. Hi, Ms. Liz. How are you? Thank you for having me. I, I am not too bad. Well, I, first of all, I want to thank you for joining me in that. Uh, I really appreciate. And this is a story that may trigger people. So if, it, if it's too hard, I do appreciate that if, you know, if you, if you can't tune in. But Audrey, let's start as a little girl, that little girl in the cafeteria. So who are you as a little girl and who are you now as a grown woman? Uh, I cry a little for that little girl, for that little girl. Um, I, you know, I, I think I would sum it up by saying in, sometime in second grade, my very astute teacher, Mrs. Lerman, took me into the teacher's bathroom and she picked me up and put me on the windowsill. And she said to me, Audrey, is everything okay at home? <laughs> and I'm not sure even like what it was that led to that. But obviously she saw that not everything was okay at home. So I, you know, I, it's hard for me to like, you know, see objectively what was going on with me, but obviously something wasn't, wasn't right. And I think, you know, it was a combination of, I was being bullied at school. I was really different from all the other kids. And, you know, I think like a combination of being sort of, you know, as a first generation American, you know, with a European parent who was trying to, you know, keep up those, you know, uh, European cultures and, and um, uh, kind of eschew, eschew um, American cultures, which made me different from everybody else. I also, my father had a lot of like OCD and um, control issues to try and sort of keep everything together, which was a result of his like, Holocaust experiences, you know, his his trauma of of childhood, and when things weren't together, he would he would fly off the handle, and the atmosphere at home seemed uh, had a kind of an abusive quality to it because we were living in fear of like when when Dad was going to go, you know, off the handle. So I think you know it was kind of scary at home, and. Um, so I, I think like we were, my sister and I, we had each other, which was great, but I think we were sort of scared children who felt very di different um, from everybody else. Uh, I guess that's the best way that I would describe it. I would say that it built some grit and resilience, so not all bad. And, you know, it was not an unloving home. It You know, it, it was, it just was not a, norm, not a normal home. <laughs> Uh, and I and I totally get that because before we went live, like I, like we shared to each other, you know, we both are uh, have family members that come from the Holocaust. You know, my Oma that gave me the tea and that, and they and they did have that form of OCD. I and I believe it. You know, a lot of them because of what they went through and and that. Uh, you know, uh, so when did you realize growing up as a child that you were? I survived. I think your father was a survivor of the Holocaust. So we were exposed really, as I said in the little bio, we were exposed so incredibly early to the Holocaust um, that we really like from the time I can remember five years old, if not younger, we were watching, you know, the show out documentaries about the Holocaust, you know, black and white, mass graves, um, 
emaciated bodies, you know, all, everything, you know, Hitler speeches, you know, raving speeches. Um, as long as I can remember, we, we, we knew about the Holocaust way before we were mature enough to understand it and not be traumatized by it. Uh, we knew my father was an escapee from, from Nazi Germany. We knew stories, but we just didn't have the understanding and maturity to, to, to understand them, to have a perspective and a context. And we, so we kind of grew up knowing, and then at some point we just stopped talking about it. It was just sort of understood. Okay, dad was a survivor. Um, he wasn't in a concentration camp. He he was an escapee, but he still went through the war. He didn't escape until 1941, which was very late. Um, and and then the details were kind of at some point just lost and forgotten. And we didn't really pick up on them till we found um, yeah, he had written you know 350 pages of uh, very very vivid details of his story that we found after he had had died in, in 2018. Uh, but yeah, so we we knew about it. We were somehow like in, entrenched in it. And yet to know and not know if that, if that makes any sense. Yep. Um, because we were too young to really know. So it's like we relived it, but without understanding it. So Audrey, you said your dad escaped in 1941. So was he part of the yes. ones that got, like uh, through the? There was a tunnel, I believe. In the no, 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 no. He, he was not. Um, there were like de there were desperate efforts to um, that his family made to try to get out. They were a little bit late in in trying to apply for a, a visa to get to the U.S. and and then when they did apply, there was tremendous resistance to immigration uh, um, from all over the world. And the United States actually put up significant barriers intentionally, the State Department did, to wow. slow down the process of immigration. And they were there was actually written statements to say, whatever you do, delay, postpone, postpone, postpone. But they didn't realize that. They just thought they had terrible luck. Like, why are we not getting our papers? Why? And so time was just running out and running out. And they had crazy schemes to try to see, like, what we can do. Should we go to China? Should we, you know, should we escape across the border and bribe guards? Should, you know, it's just really crazy. Um, and they were really, like, literally on, like, the last train out of that was allowed out of um, uh, Germany heading west because after they left, everybody else was there were these mass transports deporting everybody east where they were basically shot on arrival and and um, put into to mass graves uh, so they were uh, uh, without giving away too much of the story but they were uh, th their path out was insane edge of your seat nail biting uh, experience um, and, and pretty harrowing and, ex and quite extraordinary and then my father, you know, besides then when he came here, he had it was a pretty difficult transition, you know, as, 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 you know, in some ways it's like a typical immigrant's tale, but in some ways more, more tragic than that. But then he returned to Germany as a spy for uh, U.S. intelligence because oh. uh, he had, link, that's, what, that's what the title is. <laughs> from, uh, yeah, I wanted to get uh, into the spy because I was like, how did he get the spy? Yeah. You know, sometimes you just, the, the, the title of a book and you're like, oh my goodness, like, how did he do that? Like, how, you know, this is like a film, like a movie, right? And you're like, how did he become the spy? Like, what did he do? Like, it, it was, it really was like, it is like a movie. A couple of reviewers have said, this should be a Spielberg movie. And I'm like, yes, please, Steven, read the book. <laughs> but you just never know, <laughs> right? Who's watching Tea Time and who's going to word a mo, right? And because the story does have a good storyline to it. You know, just reading, reading just the little blippets that are online, you know, without even reading the book, it's like, oh. How did he do this? Like, where did he go? You know, so it was it was a good returning to Germany. Uh, it was in the Cold War and returning to Germany as a spy was was a great bookend, you know, to the story. I mean, that's where I decided to end it, because so, so much of his story was one of identity, too. of like, you know, who, who am I? You know, I was rejected as a German. I lost my citizenship. I was rejected as a Jew. Then I came to America and everyone was anti-Semitic. No one wanted me here either. Plus. We were in the middle of the war and everyone hated the Germans and they were they were calling me a Nazi. That's really what happened. They called him.
a Nazi when he got to America, which was, you know, the irony, <laughs> I think we can say, was, uh, you know, pretty incredible. And then, um, and then, you know, so he, he went back to Germany and had to sort of grapple with what his identity was as a, you know, was he German? Was he Jewish? Was he, uh, was he a, a man? American. He was trying so hard to become an American. And that's the title of the book, American Wolf, is, you know, it's not about the animal, the American wolf, <laughs> but his given name was Wolf. And he, when he came here, he had to give up his name Wolf. He was told by the school principal that like, you better give up your name Wolf because you'll be teased mercilessly. And so he gave it up and, and changed it to Jack, which he thought was like, you know, symbolize America. Um, you know, somebody said, become Jacob. And he's like, nah, I'm nah, too Jewish. And so he became Jack and he tried so hard to become an American and he never really like, to the end of his days, he never really quite got it. <laughs> Cause you never really do when you're an immigrant. You never really quite yeah. get, you know, uh, you know, he lost most of his accent, but whenever he said Lincoln, he always pronounced the second L. It's like Lincoln. <laughs> it's like that's the one thing. Like I was like, you know, Dad, it's Lincoln. It's just like, you know, and he always like retained a little bit of that. So, so he, um, so he, um, to me, like American Wolf was like just like the perfect title because it was really about his journey to try to become an American. And and then in the end, you know, when he goes back to Germany and he's he's homesick, he's homesick for Germany. A lot of people were, you know, they're I think yeah. any immigrant, they're homesick for their home. It doesn't matter that they threw him out. He, you know, he wanted to go back and then he had to figure out who was he after being rejected everywhere. And so that was like a good endpoint. Plus, it was really interesting going back and and then the whole thing of what Americans did after being at war with Germany, but then accepting Nazis because they were now fighting communism, which is, you know, a fascinating part of, of history. So, um, so yeah, but, you know, of course he came out traumatized from the, from the experience. He lost so much. It's just like a series of losses. Um, and the, the outcome of that is that he held on so desperately, you know, to what he had so that he became, you know, quite, compulsive and frightened, you know, always waiting, you know, for when the other shoe was going to drop. And that, that affected, of course, our, our upbringing tremendously. To this day, Liz, <laughs> really affected us. How many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots of hours. We can, we can the couch, have tea all day. We, 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 we both have things that we have to, right? Uh, after this tea time. But I, I want to get into when you grew up, were you in your house? Did they speak? And did your dad speak German or did he just stop the language completely? No, he spoke German to his mother. So my, uh, his, uh, I knew my Oma, and I, I know you told me you have an Oma as well. So I knew my Oma, who is a German speaking, um, grandmother who was, uh, you know, German, I don't know, I can't speak for your grandmother, but my German grandmother was a, not a warm, fuzzy, like, you know, sometimes people have an idea of the Jewish grandmother, you know, no, she was a German grandmother. She was, you know, she, she was, she was good. She made us dresses and she took, took, she babysat for us and she took care of things and she did things, but she was not like fuzzy and like, you know, you know, she was, you know, she spoke German. We didn't understand her well. She seemed old before her time. Yeah. She she walked around carrying her pocketbook harshly in her, the crook of her, she looked, looked like Queen Elizabeth. She would carry her pocketbook <laughs> like this. She was like, uh, there was something, you know, but, but she was, I mean, she was, like, listen, she, if it wasn't for her, they never would have gotten out because my grandfather, who I never met, um, was kind of a character, he was a bit of a dreamer, which was made for these great characters in the book because they were, they just were these great characters. My grandfather was a clown and his, some of his clowning actually helped help them too because they got, they were very close. He was very close to getting deported twice. Once um, during Kristallnacht, the, the night of broken glass when Jewish men were being rounded up. And, um, uh, there was another time when he was uh, taking my my aunt to um, uh, to England, um, and he got pulled off of a train by a, a band of Nazis, and his clowning around saved him from really certain deportation. So the, the two of them, her her uh, Oma's um, 
persistence and diligence and hard work and drive and his antics were a good um you know good for survival uh, but did not make for a happy household but made for wonderful book characters you know yeah so even though the book is nonfiction, it really reads like fiction because you have these great wonderful characters and a great adventure story in a way um you know full of you know edge of your seat uh, things that happen and emotion and drama and life and death and love and blah, blah, blah. you know all these <laughs> so, <things are> great. <laughs> very well so. so audrey because your grandfather the one that you never met was like a yes. clown did your dad have a little bit of that sense of humor from time totally, to time. totally. I mean, my, that was the thing about my father is like he could be, you know, anything about him that felt uh, abusive. Like, hey, when I was young, I didn't really appreciate it, obviously, but um, he, 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 it was always out of fear, you know, that again of like losing control of things, and he was trying to pull it together. But he had a whimsical side, and he had a great appreciation for music, for art, for for a sunrise, you know, for a flower, you know, a, just a tremendous appreciation for, for those things and a definite goofiness. Um, you could see both of his parents in him without doubt. I mean, he was definitely not, I think he had periods of d depression, but I think he, um, uh, he also had, a, you know, a, a lust for life as well. Um, no, no doubt. Um, Opa Arthur was, in him uh, no doubt and that's why i also like i felt like it was even though i had never met my grandfather i felt he was easy to write i could i could see him through my father like i could i could definitely imagine him. plus my father had written some specific stories about some of the things that he had uh done that were a little nutty and crazy so you know it was it was possible for me to weave weave that into the story i could weave my bangs out of my eyes <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you're sharing about your Oma yeah. and all of that, you know, growing up, I always thought my Oma was mad at me because of the way that they spoke, right? With that. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like, she's mad at me. Like, what did I do? Like, you know, like, it was like she was angry. And then I would cry a lot. And she'd be like, why are you crying? And I'd be like, I, I, I don't know. Because her English was really hard when we were younger. But as she got older, her English started to get a little bit better is she slowly lost the German, right? But she would teach us little words in Germany, in German, and, and kind of just give us that story of when it gets too serious, crack a joke. When when it gets too heavy for you, crack a joke. And I'd be like, but that's not the right time to crack a joke there, Oma. And we got close because I was that little girl that was that shy, quiet one where she came with this sternness and she was like, I'm going to toughen you up, like, you know, and gave me that tea. But she had the biggest heart out there. Like, you know, she would, she would turn. It, it was like the one moment she was really nice. The next moment it was like, you better behave yourself. Like, you know, like she'd give you this look and it'd be like, oh, okay. You know, we're not going yeah, I, mean, I don't want to generalize, but I don't think the German culture is known for being effusive, you know, <laughs> in their nature. Uh, but I don't think that means that there's no, you know, that there isn't love or heart there. It's just a different style. It's a style, you know, yeah. a cult cultural style. And, and uh, uh, but I once, <laughs> my, my, my grandmother once made um, dinner for me and my sister and I went home to my parents and they said how was it and i said i said i complained that the portions were too small and then my parents told my grandmother and i got uh, an earful oh my god of like the you know the insults and the horror i was like oh my god <laughs> she was she was so mad she was so mad but it was true everything you know that was also true there was never a sense of like generosity of yep. like everything was a portions, everything was controlled, everything was, you know, um, and, and, and yes, that's that's how we grew up. It measured. It was a measured house. Well, I think it's a, it's what they were taught, right? So that that's what the pattern, you know, the cycle of falling into it. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, the OCD with your dad. Uh, my Oma was the same way, was severe OCD. She had her little purse all the time, too. It was like this little doctor's purse, like little black purse. And she had like all <laughs> her stuff in there. And if anything ever happened to her, that was the purse that you needed to go to, you know? So, you know, there and there's 
there's a story behind the Holocaust that, you know, we, we can get some positive from it, you know, because from every pain and suffering, there's a, there's a positive message. It's on how we treat people and how the humanity is in the world, right? Because look at, we're going through it again. We're repeating the same patterns because we didn't listen to the first time it happened. You know, we're, we're seeing it today in today's world, you know, where people are going to war again because they're not understanding the story that was in the past, you know? So I want to get into the, sh I found something about the ships that I want to get into uh, the, the horror ships. Yeah. And I, and I seen that you have some of the images and in the images on your website, you have 15 people were supposed to be on this ship, but there was over 1,200, I believe. Yes, it was a slight over, you know, you know how like the airlines overbook? They overbook by, by, by 1,192 or something like that. Yes, it was a, it was a little bit of overbooking. Um, there's so a lot of people know about the ship, the St. Louis. It was a very famous ship that people, you know, who are somewhat familiar with Holocaust history. Uh, it was a tragic story of a ship that had, um, this goes back to like 1938, where people were still taking like, uh, you know, like uh, luxury liners. They paid a ticket, they got a, a board. Um, the St. Louis was supposed to go to Cuba. People had papers, they had gotten proper papers, and they were going to go there and like wait out the problem and then maybe go back to Europe afterwards. But when it got to Cuban waters, Cuba suddenly like reneged and said, no, we don't want to take them. And America said, well, we don't want to take them either. Nobody wanted to take them. And so this, I think they had like maybe eight or 900 passengers. And ultimately a bunch of countries in Europe, uh, well, England and Denmark and Holland decided to take back the passengers. They were all split up. But about 300 people from that uh, ship ended up being murdered because, of course, many people, Jews in Europe ended up going into concentration camps. And so that's like a well-known uh, tragic story of a ship. Uh, but the people on the ship did not have horrible conditions. They were people who had money who ended up, you know, they booked their ticket and they went. In 1941, people were desperate to get out and they got out any way they could. And my parents ended up, they already had missed a ship that was supposed to go to China. They had, um, that ship was supposed to leave from Genoa, Italy. And like on the day my parents, were, my, my father was supposed to take that ship, Italy joined the war. And so they couldn't go to Italy. Like, you know, once you were in the war, like you couldn't leave from the ports. So you always had to leave from a neutral country. So they had a, a ship um, in uh, leaving from from Barcelona, and then by the time they got to Barcelona, their visas expired, and they couldn't board the ship. If you didn't have a valid visa to the U.S., you couldn't board the ship. That was the rule. So then they were like racing through Spain to try to find another ship, and they had help. Uh, the, some of the people who helped them in Spain were the uh, volunteers, Quakers, unbelievably helpful. Um, and there were other people, uh, there were like uh, people who, Jews who had converted to, to Christianity to, because you couldn't live in Spain unless you were Christian, that you, as a Jew, you could only pass through Spain. So you could, only, they also only had a window of like two weeks to pass through Spain. Otherwise they'd be deported back to Germany. So there were, those were all like the barriers that they were facing, tremendous like bureaucratic barriers. If you have the right paperwork at the right time, this visa expired, that visa expired, you had to leave Spain, you had to leave. I mean, it was unbelievable, like bureaucratic nightmare. So they ended up on this uh, ship called the Navamar, which was leaving um, from Seville. And it was a freight ship. And they basically took the... Uh, the holds of the freight ship, which were made for like rubber and, you know, steel and things like that. And they lined them up like the way a concentration camp would look with like three bunks high, bunks all across. And each hold held about 300 people and they were below no air, nothing. Wow. And, and, um, and it was a multi-week trip across the water, which, um, about a third of the people developed dysentery. And so everybody was sick and they were basically, and the crew 
just we basically went on strike and said, we're not cleaning, we're not doing anything. And some of the crew actually um, attempted um, a mutiny and wanted to turn the ship around. That particular ship that they were on, it turned out Chagall's family was, I think his, da his daughter was on the ship and some of his artwork was on the ship. And a lot was written about the boat when they got here. There were tons of newspaper articles, a lot of press across the country because it was so horrific. The conditions were so horrific, but it hasn't gotten a lot of attention in any of the like books that have been written. Um, and it is one of the big, you know, catastrophic uh, events. I mean, many of the people, of course, did make it here alive, but it's just not much has spoken about it. And I think it's, a, you know, another story I think worth telling that people don't know about about how the conditions people had to go through to to come here and how again how tra traumatic the experience was. In the end, people couldn't live below ground because just the sick were there. They were sick, yeah. dying in their own excrement, and everybody crowded aboard the um, uh, th the deck uh, just to get air. Um, yeah. And they they had no refrigeration because it wasn't meant to be a passenger ship. So they brought live animals on board and they were killing them for food on, wow. on board the ship. So it's, uh, you know, it is really a, a fascinating piece of history um, that I now have given away. So <laughs> I don't have to but, <laughs> but you know, I, I, she gave you a little tip, guys. You know, <laughs> you can all, always no, read the emotional <laughs> content. <laughs> so emotional. But Audrey, what I liked about when I went to your site and I got to get some information, I was like, we don't, we didn't hear about these ships. We didn't hear about how they got out. How they, you know, because there was still hell for them just to get out of the hell. You know, it it, it was a trend. There was a lot of transfer that wasn't spoken of about the Holocaust, how their survivors actually got out. And that's what I liked about finding that information is was knowing that my Oma and my my Opa, you know, went through these camps and went through this process to get here gives you a better perspective on understanding why they were the way they were, you know, why they were so stern, why they were like, you know, appreciate that slice of bread you know whether it had a little bit of mold on it or not you cut the mold off and you eat the you ate the bread you know what i mean uh I still, Liz, I still i still cut the mold off i still eat the bread okay i'll be <laughs> honest with you you know those habits die hard you know what's a little more you know i'm a gastroenterologist i know you didn't mention i'm a physician and i'm gonna tell you a little mold never hurt anybody <laughs> Well, that's it, right? Because like they it. use they use mold for penicillin. Like you know, these are things that exactly. people don't. What's a little mold? Come on. No, but that's, we, a story for another, that's a different conversation. <laughs> but we actually grew up appreciating stuff a little bit more, you know. Like as you said, like when you went and had dinner at Jeroma's and you came home and you got like an earful because you were like there was not enough. But for them, that was a lot. You know, so and they had nothing. They had nothing. I have like a story in the book, you know, totally sure. Everything in the book is 100 percent true, um, but it's just written in a form that's, you know, very digestible and, and, and emotional and readable about how they celebrated a birthday. And, you know, they went to the store and, and all I could find was like an orange and a potato. And they made like a glorious meal out of it because because that's what you did. You know, it's uh, and listen, I mean, that story is not unique to the Holocaust, right? That could be a, that could be a depression story yeah. or, a, you know, a, a potato famine story, you know, they, it's just not unique, but, and, and people who've had, you know, those kinds of hardships could listen, you know, I read Angela's ashes too, you know, I mean, like, listen, you can write, a, you can write a book about, I mean, hardship does make for great literature and yeah. great human experiences and a lot of good comes out of that but also you know a lot of trauma too but it does build resilience you know no question about it and uh uh, uh but yeah it makes for good storytelling you know you know and and yeah you do appreciate what you have certainly when you you know when you have less right well, you, you understand a little bit more, and especially when you get older. When you're a child, you're a child, right? So you don't understand 
the the less but when you get older then you're like oh, okay now i understand why you know so writing this story your father's story and finding these notes audrey how did you feel like as an adult knowing that he went through all of this yeah i i would think that i you know i think again when i was younger i had a lot of anger towards my father because you know there was a lot of denial of things for us like you know we couldn't go into college and we didn't have things and you know there was and again there was sort of like you know some of the relationship was very volatile but i think like after i had kids i had really made peace with that you know as an adult and um but i think what i didn't have till i wrote the book is a full appreciation for what he had gone through i I didn't really realize like how much he had lost, how much over and over again, even after he came here, the loss is just stacked up. I, so I think I didn't have the the sympathy um, uh, for him. Like I, I, I had so much, moment no no <laughs> it's okay you're allowed to do that on tea time I, if i if i was allowed to eat or drink i would i would i would have a sip of something right now but a, a procedure coming up after this i i had um like a a pity and sympathy for him that i as i was writing it that um that it was just like new and made me just feel such great like mourning and sadness for him as a as a person and as the child because i was writing i was writing in the first person because it was his story so i wrote in his voice and it started with his childhood so i'm feeling for him as the child that he was not just the adult that i knew but the child that he was who had like lost you know like one first he can't go to school with his friends and then his friends all leave him and then his he has to part from his you know beloved uncle and aunt and he's just like one thing after another after another and then you know then all of a sudden his home is you know there's no furniture in the house and then there's no food you know it's just like this steady loss of uh you know and then and then of course the thing here is like you think like ah oh, and they you know they made it out which you know even as I was like reading his story, I was always at the edge of my seat wondering, did they make it out? Are they gonna get out? And and that's always like the big joke because I'm, I'm alive. So of course I know they made it out, but it feels when you're reading it, like you're you're at the edge of your seat because they have so many obstacles and you're wondering, oh, are they gonna make it? Uh, and then, they, but they make it out and you think like, oh, finally. And then like get here and you're like, but it's, it's not over. It's like, it's like, it's, and I'm sure that's how it felt for a lot of people who, whether they survived a concentration camp or whether they made it here, is you think, oh, I'm free, I'm free. And then you're like, oh, no, it's like the, you know, it's now it's the whole new set of challenges are just beginning. Like I made it here. What happened to all my relatives? Oh, they didn't make it. You know, you know, I'm waiting, waiting to hear. There's a lot of no news. And then all of a sudden realizing that they probably didn't survive or I'm like trying to get a, head, a start and I'm poverty stricken piss poor you know so i think that's that really that crash of realization that freedom is not the you know is not the like this sort of like light on the hill but it's the just the start of a very difficult path forward um you know that just that realization for me was just also like you know very enlightening um and uh but it's has you know the book has a, a lot of humor and a ha happy ending and love and you know ex a lot of excitement so um but yeah i felt i felt really in terms of my relationship with my father like i felt um i felt just uh yes yeah, sadness and um sympathy Well, and, and growing up in, in that up and down roller coaster home, right? It's not that they were, you know, again, they went through so much. And it was hard for them to understand when things were too, like, I know what my own, when it was too calm or too peaceful, she was like on guard. 
She was like, ah, something's yes. going something's to happen. Something, yes. We have to prepare. We have to be ready. We have to be. Yes. And, and I was like, like, why was she always on guard? Like, and, and she, she gave me that <clears throat> as a child because I spent a lot of time with her and got to get her to tell me the stories on how, because she's a survivor, but her parents didn't make it. They got to the encampment and, you know, so she, that's where the tea came in is she said, you know what, when I came to Canada, I had a cup of tea and I sat, I recharge, reflect and release. And that's what I want you to do with your tea, my dear, is I want you to serve that way. I want you to serve life and look at life like that, you know, because life is hard. You're going to have that good. You're going to have that bad, but they were always on guard. They were always ready if they had to go. Right. Like it was always like, <laughs> let's get out of here. <laughs> well, I, I, you sound like your grandmother had a wonderful perspective. I don't think that my father ever really developed a perspective. I think he was kind of stuck. Um, but I, my, just to talk about like being on guard, like my sister once got a raise and my father said, I don't know, she'll price herself out of the market. <laughs> and then she, and then she bought a house in the Hamptons, you know, when she was doing very well, she was single at the, at the time. And he said, I don't, she'll isolate herself. <laughs> she'll never meet anybody. <laughs> but she actually made a party and she met her husband at a party at her house. So there was like this always like nothing good was ever good. It was always like laced with the bad that could come from, you know, something good. It was, it was never, nothing good was ever good. It was always you know, <laughs> but well, I can and, understand. And that had to have caused some form of trauma in you and your sister as well, you know, because every time you did something good, it was, it's not good enough. Like it's not, you know, we shouldn't be celebrating this. We shouldn't be getting too happy about this. Cause I know that. Yeah, that's still there. That's, that's never, that, that's not going away. I don't think I'm going to be 60 next week. It is not going away. Liz. It is not. <laughs> I think at this point it's, it's, it's too late for that. <laughs> Well, and, 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 and that's why I wanted to have this story on here because it's your, your father was a survivor, but it was passed on to his children on yeah. how to be on guard as well. You know, we were given that we were like, okay, if we, we can't celebrate this too much because it, it, you know, we, we don't deserve this. It's not meant for us. You know, um, I know when good things happen, I'm always like, oh, well, when's the bad coming, <laughs> you know? Yep. Yep. All I can say is yes. <laughs> I totally get it. And yeah, that's right. But I mean, I'm, you know, I'm light years ahead of where, I mean, my sister and I are light years ahead of, you know, where my family was. We, we celebrate, we enjoy, I think again, there's just the more deeply rooted psychological things are there, but we, in terms of how we live our lives, it's very different, you know, from, from how my, my parents live their lives. Um, but yeah, the psychological stuff is, is, you know, certainly, certainly there, but it's what it is. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I still live my life without regret and I'm not even sorry for my upbringing because I know it made me more, you know, not only more resilient, but also like, I like a certain amount of like ingenuity to sort of like, I didn't have things growing up. So I had to like invent them, create them, you know, <laughs> sew them <laughs> you know it's you know all that stuff is good well they gave you that grit right you said you got grit and, re and resilience mm -hmm. and you know sometimes that's what it takes right for us to get our resilience and keep going on so i audrey i want to ask you how long did it take you to write the book um for about three years there were a lot of like you know there was i mean there was the initial writing i i mean i I toyed with it a little bit. I tried writing it, you know, in the present tense and I tried in the past tense. And then like the first solid draft probably took like a year to a year and a half. And then I, I had, um, I, I actually like queried it to agents and I, I didn't get a response. And so I put it away, like, with, you know, with a deep rejection of like, Oh, nobody wants my book. And then, but after a while I picked it up again and looked at it with fresh eyes and I did a lot of, rewriting of parts that I thought were weaker and that time I think I like really was a good thing you know so that rejection was kind of good for me so 
after picking it up and reworking it, that total time probably as just like another six months I, I spent on the on the rewriting. And I could I honestly I could spend ten years rewriting and making trying to make it better and better and better, you know. Um, but uh, so I think it's whole, three years total is probably like the the length of time. Um, Yeah, and, and and the reason I ask that is because these stories are hard to tell, right? And for you to to read all of these notes, it must have took some time to process it as well, you know. And did you? Like, yeah, there were like I mean, there was a lot of detail, but they were you know it was it was it was it was dry. It was some of it was out of order. Some of the facts were inaccurate, like historical facts were in, in, not quite accurate. They had to be fact checked. My father didn't know what happened to some of his relatives. I researched it and found out like what happened to friends and relatives that he, he had no knowledge of. He had no internet when he wrote down the notes. And then there was, the other thing was the tone. Um, you know, he, he put in like a, how do I put this? Like, um, if, uh, like what if I said to you, like he wrote, Oh, my sister was like a lazy student, um, and she was like a, his sister was much older than than him. She was like twelve. She was nine years older than him, so he would be three. She was twelve, and and he would say like she was a lazy student and she was a like a sour mouthed adolescent or something. I'm thinking like how could he have said that? He was he was he was a child. How would he have like been able to make that judgment of her? And I'm starting to realize that his his judgments in his writing are really not his but really his mother's and he somehow like um enmeshed some of his thoughts and ideas or he would say that one of his relatives like an aunt was ugly and i'm like you're a child what do you mean she's ugly like you're you're five what do you, what do you mean so like, i think that's how you got to tell the story of your grandfather is because through the re reading of the notes you realize that maybe this is what he heard his father say about people. You know? What he heard more, what he heard his mother say. It was much more what he heard his mother say. Exactly. So he would like he was clearly um, telling her version that he had heard and kind of incorporated and made them his own ideas. But it didn't really read very well when you're trying to tell a story through the eyes of a child. He's not going to say. Uh, Aunt Irma's complexion was so sallow, you know, like this would not be what a child would say. So I had to sort of reattribute the appropriate uh, condemnations from the to the appropriate person, the judgmental grandmother, you know, my grandmother. And he had to maintain the eyes of a child in, in seeing the, the things as they were. So that's where I took some artistic license is to separate out what a child would observe. Um, and then attribute those judgments to the judgmental, his judgmental mother. So I, I think that, yeah, there was a little bit of artistic, I didn't, the facts are absolutely as they were, nothing was changed, but some of those observations I had to just sort out uh, to, to get the right um, tone. Uh, and that took a little bit of, of work. And then also just to bring the reader into the story, because when, when a person is telling a story of what happened to them, they say things like, we would go to the park every Sunday. We would do this. We would do that. We would eat this. We would eat that. Well, that's not very fun reading, you know, for a reader. You want yeah. to be there in the story, so you have to create something that, you know, again reads like a like a novel. And yeah. so, it, I, you know, have to, the whole style had to change, so that you're brought in, in real time. Um, yeah. So Audrey, growing up with a uh, with your father and that, did you find like when you write, do you write in first person or third person, or do you write in both? Yeah. So I uh, so again, I tried to write it in first person, but then I was like, no, it's not my story, and he's a boy and everything. So I I and it's it's got to be sort of his voice, even though it's my words. So I had tried that for a while. I was I tried first person, I tried present tense, but then it's nineteen. 30s, you know, uh, so, so I went to, uh, you know, I'm a first time author. So, I, you know, other than writing, you know, medical chapters and consult notes, I had never done anything that was written creatively, except, you know, when I was 
13. <laughs> so, so it was my, you know, it was, it was, uh, it took a few tries to see if I could do it. Um, and, and I was like, can I bring a, a character into, can I bring the reader into a book if it's in the past tense and the third person? And the answer is a resounding yes, absolutely. Um, you can definitely do it. And, um, uh, I, so yeah, the answer is yes. I figured out how to how to do it, and it can be done, and it's been done, and uh, so it is. It is written in the it is written in the first person, but as he the he is the the uh, the speaker. It's not me. He is the speaker, um, and it's past tense. So Audrey, before we before we get your cup of tea, and I get your words from you. Writing this story, did a lot of Holocaust survivors reach out to you or family members that were, uh, that had members that were survivors? Did they reach out after reading this story? Um, so I actually found family members uh, through the process of writing this. I found family members because I was trying to like find my family history and find some of the people who I had written about. And I found, um, I found a, a, a cousin my father had come to this country with, uh, and the our first cousin was here, and then they lost touch. There was like a family rift. And I found the the daughter of that cousin, who would be my second cousin. And I looked her up and researched her and found her, and she lives a block and a half from my son in Chicago. Oh, wow. What are they, a block and a half. I mean, because Chicago is such a small town. <laughs> block and a half. Mm. And oh, wow. we've been in touch and we've met. And my son has been to, he went to breakfast with her on um, Yom Kippur. And she's a lovely woman my age-ish. You know, and, you know, just, it, that was an amazing thing. I am also um, read uh, some people, some relatives from Australia uh, contacted me. It was not really through the book itself, but from just my efforts to try to find people in this process. Um, uh, and because I started a family tree and I started doing stuff in ancestry and, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And um, and then you asked me another question and I was going to answer that um, in terms of re people reaching out. Yes, I am. So a couple of Holocaust sur survivor groups. I reached out to me and asked me to speak at um, and give you know like a book signing live talk. Uh, so that seems to be uh, definitely something that people are interested in. So that's because when I wrote the book, I mean it wasn't just like, oh I want to write a book. It was like I think my father has a story that yeah I uh, that I want to tell because I think it's a story that needs to be told like it's from an educational standpoint. And the more I could tell it to more people. I also want to tell it to young people. So I'm working with schools and school libraries to try to get the book. And because it has, I think it's, it works for young adults too, because yeah. it's told from his perspective of a young person. You know, my father from the time he's a child till he's in his early twenties, it works very well. It's very readable. So I'm trying to get it into, I have a couple of big school districts who are interested in it. So, so I think it, yeah, it spans quite a big range you know, readership. So that's the goal. Well, I, and, and you know, sometimes our, the pain and the stories need to be told so we can educate, you know, and I'm so glad that you're in the schools because we do need to get the, the younger generation to understand the history of what happened, right? And the story on how, how everybody got over here and how they still had a journey once they got here, you know, we need to let those stories out. So Audrey, I want to ask you, if I give you the letters T-E-A, what three words would you give me for a cup of tea? Uh, tolerance, empathy, and action. Now, why those words? Tolerance is a is two types of tolerance. Tolerance is like, you know, world tolerance, you know, that we should be tolerant of people of different ethnicities and different sexual preferences and identities. And then there's like personal tolerance, like learning to become tolerant tolerant of people's individual traits, which is something that I feel I have to work on every day, like my own tolerance of, you know, my husband and, you know, things like that. Like I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's a constant struggle to be accepting of people's, you know, that they are who they are, they're individuals and they have their own stuff. And, and that's like, for me, like, I feel I'm better at the big 
tolerance, but I work have to work harder at the, the little tolerance. So that's what I'm working on. Empathy, because I feel like if you, I think empathy, like I actually am pretty good at, I think because I was from this sort of like somewhat abusive kind of background, it's unintentional abuse. I feel like I have empathy for people, for their struggles. I think like from a career in medicine, you know, 35 years of medicine, I think I was able to have a lot of empathy for the struggles of families and what they were facing. But I think without empathy, you can't have tolerance. Like if the two go yeah. hand in hand, you have to understand um, and be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes to understand. It's like even when they don't have ideas that are the same as yours, like even if you're a Democrat and they're a Republican or whatever, like you have to be able to understand people's where they're coming from, um, or they're or they're just there can't be there can't be peace in the world and in your heart without that. And um, action, because I so often just hear people that complain about stuff and don't, don't do anything, and I'm a person of action. So it's like, if you have a problem, okay, that's okay, and I, I understand. But now what are you going to do? That next yeah, step. Yeah, like, okay, what's, what's the solution? <laughs> yeah, what's the solution? And even if that solution is, I don't know, but... I'm going to talk to somebody or I'm going to get help or I'm going to ask for advice or like that's so that's an action step you know yeah. that you know but the doing nothing and the saying of like oh you know I'm I'm you know I'm so upset that I'm overweight while you're eating or whatever like you know like okay like whatever you're upset about like whatever's bothering you like okay and you know so maybe the a is for and and <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's my, that's my uh, so tolerance empathy and you know, I actually like that. I like action and, and where are we going with this? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I think because of having the history and the past that we both had, you know, we're like, okay, what are you going to do about it? Like, are you going to just complain about it all the time? Or are you going to fix it? Like, you're going to find a solution. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be on the world stage. You don't have to be like Greta Thunberg or whatever. <laughs> but you know, but you, you can do like you can take a small step. You know, make a phone call. You had a rift with a family member, and you're upset about it, or you know, pick up the phone, write a letter, whatever it is. Like I don't care what it is, but do something. Do something. Well, <laughs> and that's the word that you gave me for when I asked you one word to describe yourself. You said that you were a doer, and now I I, I understand it. I'm like okay. I was wondering why you gave me the word doer, but now I get it now that I've sat with you and I'm just like, oh, she, she I get it. Got to do it. Like, just do something. Yes. You know? Yes. A Nike <laughs> commercial. <laughs> <laughs> so, Audrey, for if anybody would like to reach out to you, how can they reach out to you? Uh, so my website is uh, AudreyBurnbaumAuthor.com. Uh, that's just for general, you know, information about the book. And there's a, you know, a lot of graphics about, uh, you know, just past history and everything. But in terms of reaching me, I'm on social with um, uh, uh, most of the social is Audrey Birnbaum Author, whether it's Facebook or Instagram. Um, so those are probably the best ways to, to find me. So, and Audrey, before we wrap up, because we have less than two minutes here, what's the name of the second book, if you can give it away? Or is it just the, <laughs> yeah, second, the second book? Yeah, the second book is fiction. But, you know, it's still, and it's, a, you know, it's an action and adventure, steamy. It, it's a um, totally different kind of story. But, but it still focuses on relationships. It's interpersonal relationships, you know, marriage and affairs and, you know, all the deep stuff that is still, like, so critical you know i think what makes american wolf good is it's still like you know it's still a family story and it's still about people and human nature um but the book is called the climb the climb oh the climb and it has a double meaning uh so you can take of that what you will um so yes it's a i'm having really enjoy writing it's so therapeutic um it's the only time I'm not busy doing a hundred things is when I'm writing. Well, I really appreciate your writing because these are incredible books. So if anybody would like to go and grab these books, check out the website. Uh, I believe they are on Barnes and Noble and Amazon as well. 
check those out. Grab that book. Audrey, I really want to thank you for joining me on Tea Time today. Uh, you know, I got to go back down a little bit down history lane as well, you know. Uh, so I will be back at uh, 3 p.m. and at 7 p.m. with two more tea times. Today is trigger day warning, so I'm just giving everybody heads up. The second guest that will be up uh, uh, at 3 p.m. is Richard Sparks. He's a comedian writer, uh, and we're going to talk about his life journey on writing. And then we're going to finish up with Sherry Akins, and she'll be talking about a real-life murder that happened in Canada. So we'll be doing a lot of trigger warnings, so if you can't tune in, no hard feelings, Miss Liz understands. And again, Audrey, I want to thank you for joining me and having a good, strong cup of tea. And keep serving that tolerance, empathy, and action and <laughs> solutions to make a better life and a better cup of tea at the end of the day. Thank you. Until then, I'll slip. I'm so sorry for your loss, too, really. Uh, but thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome.